Hey, welcome back to Pete's Behavioral Insights and Theories, aka Pete's Bits. Today I want to talk a little bit about social media. Social media is pretty cool, right? Statistically speaking, you're probably watching this video because you clicked on a link that you saw on your social media, which is awesome. That means that if it wasn't for social media, I wouldn't be able to connect with you. Social media has also allowed me to connect with lots of other cool people, like Professor Wendy Wood and Professor Elizabeth Loftus, who I made videos with recently. But social media also has a dark side. If you've watched the recent, very well-made documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, then you probably know what I'm talking about. The documentary highlights that the algorithms designed to keep us engaged on their platforms are also driving increased polarization in our views and lead to the rapid spread of fake news. I think one of the most memorable lines from the whole documentary is when we heard that fake news spread six times faster on social media than truth. Now, understandably, the documentary didn't go into too much depth about the psychological mechanisms that drive increased polarization and the spread of fake news. So that's what I want to explore in today's video. Today, I'm going to teach you about three cognitive biases that lead to increased polarization and more fake news on social media. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. So how does behavioral science play into social media algorithms? While platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter have algorithms that are designed to keep us engaged as much as possible with their platforms so that they can keep pushing us ads and keep making more money. Which means that the sole purpose of the algorithm is to try and find out what kinds of information are we likely to click on, pay attention to, and share with our friends. Which begs the question, how do humans decide what to click on pay attention to and share with their friends. Do you think that this decision is made using our system too? Do you think that we logically weigh up the pros and cons of everything that we read and see and pay attention to? No, of course not. The ubiquitous of social media in our lives has meant that we have a huge overload of information, and whenever there's an overload of information, we of course make decisions heuristically, based on biases and rules of thumb. So there are three biases that I want to talk about today that relate to social media. The three biases are confirmation bias, negativity bias, and social monitoring bias. Let's start with confirmation bias. Confirmation bias, or bias dissimulation as it's sometimes called, is this idea that once we have a hypothesis or an opinion about an issue, we will seek out information that confirms that hypothesis and underweight and disregard information that contradicts it. For example, if you think that climate change is a hoax, then you will actively seek out information that helps confirm that climate change is a hoax and disregard and underweight information that says that climate change is real. As an example of confirmation bias from the literature, we can look at this study on whether people believe that video games cause violence or not. In this study, participants were asked to read two fake papers about whether or not violent video games cause violence or don't. The first fake paper concluded that violent video games do lead to more violence, and the second fake paper concluded that violent video games had no effect on violence. And the researchers were asking the participants to rate the quality of these studies. And what they found was that if a participant came into the study believing that video games caused violence, then they would rate the study that confirmed their belief as being better quality than the other study. And similarly, if they went into this study believing that video games had no effect on violence, then they would rate the paper that confirmed that belief as better quality. What's more is that after the study had concluded, both groups had more polarized views. In other words, if you came into this study believing that video games might cause violence, then you left the study feeling fully convinced that video games were a cause of violence. And if you came into the study thinking that video games probably don't cause violence, then you left the study feeling very sure that video games don't cause violence. And so we can see how this effect can lead to more polarization. These people are reading balanced sets of information. One study that's against video games and one study that's pro video games. And yet people are reading balanced information and coming out with more polarized views. And algorithms on social media make this effect worse. By giving us suggested articles to read or recommended videos, or by simply placing belief consistent information at the top of your newsfeed, the algorithms know that this is the kind of information that we're much more likely to click on, agree with and share. And perhaps what's most scary is that these platforms don't even have to necessarily know what you specifically believe in to have a pretty good guess. For example, say the top five people that I interact with on social media are sympathizers with the Black Lives Matter movement. Then the platform can make a pretty good guess that I also sympathize with the Black Lives Matter movement and will push pro Black Lives Matter articles and news to the top of my feed to start this confirmation bias rabbit hole slash echo chamber because we like to hear that we're right. Having someone else confirm what we already know feels good to us. 
and so it makes consuming this type of content addictive and keeps us engaged on their platforms. Okay, let's move on from confirmation bias. Another type of information bias that we have is called negativity bias, which means that we have a much more heightened sensitivity to negative news than positive news. Now, evolutionary speaking, this makes sense, right? If you're trying to survive in the wild, then a human that's evolved to be highly sensitive to an animal that's about to eat you is going to have a survival advantage over one who doesn't. But because in modern society, not many of us have animals that are gonna jump out and kill us, this heightened sensitivity to threats on our life has actually become a disadvantage. This trope is well known amongst news circles, which is why we have the famous phrase, if it bleeds, it leads. The idea being that if something is gory, gross, and threatening, it's much more likely to be paid attention to, and therefore get your news station higher ratings. In terms of social media, we can see how this played out in the Ebola crisis from a few years ago. When Ebola was first discovered and being reported about, tweets about Ebola were about 100 per minute. But once the first case of Ebola was diagnosed in the USA, suddenly, Tweets about Ebola rose from 100 per minute to 6,000 per minute. And a negativity bias and a heightened sensitivity to threats can really explain why. Suddenly, after someone was diagnosed in the US, Ebola wasn't some strange disease from a faraway land. Instead, it was a very real threat to our life. So then many people pay attention to it and talk about it. But of course, people who make fake news articles also understand that this is a bias that we have. And so very rapidly after the first diagnosis of Ebola in the US, fake news about Ebola exploded all over the internet, with people falsely believing that Ebola could be contracted through the air, through water, and through food. And of course, we have seen similar effects, probably even worse effects with the recent COVID-19 pandemic. When coronavirus first came onto the new scene, it was just some strange disease from a far off land called Wuhan in China. But suddenly, when coronavirus started being diagnosed in Europe and in the US, Fake news about COVID-19 spread on social media like wildfire. The conversation around coronavirus quickly transformed from a very scientific debate about containment of the pathogen to all kinds of wild accusations of government conspiracy, as well as all sorts of myths about transmission, including this one, which I think is hilarious, but also simultaneously makes me lose faith in humanity. There is no end to the myths surrounding the spread of the virus. Restaurant owners say people are avoiding Chinese food and that the footfall is on the decline. So you think you just need to add some garlic and some soy sauce to your chicken and suddenly that chicken has coronavirus? Come on, people. And the final bias I wanna talk about is a heightened sensitivity to social information. You might have heard of terms like herding behavior, social proof, or social norming in the past. They're all basically fancy psychological words for peer pressure. The idea being that we reason for our actions by saying, well, if everyone else is doing it, it must be good. For example, take the study that tried to simulate a kind of iTunes environment. Participants were asked to listen to samples of songs and then download the songs which they liked. Now these participants were split into two groups. One group ended up with a fairly even distribution of song preferences across all of the samples available. Whereas the other group had highly polarized views about which songs were good. The songs that were popular were much more popular than in that first group. And overall there was less variety of song preferences. So what was the difference between these two groups? Well, as you might have guessed, the second group had access to social information. They could see what other people in the study were choosing. In the same way that on Spotify, you can see how many people have streamed the song before, and on the App Store, you can see how many people have downloaded the app before. Now, a socially motivated way of making decisions might be a useful rule of thumb when it comes to deciding on songs or apps but consider applying the same type of thinking to attitudes and beliefs. Because social media, surprise, surprise, is social, which means that unlike the people in the study, we're not blind sampling little bits of information before we come to a reasoned conclusion about what to believe. Instead, social media bombards us with points of view and opinions from people in our in-group. Therefore, just by the mere fact that we are aware of what our peers think, means that we are far more likely to agree with them, which, just like the study on song preferences, is likely to lead to greater polarization and less variety of opinion overall. And so, if you made it this far in the video, I hope I've given you some good food for thought for the future. And here's a quick summary of the three biases that we explored in today's video. So the first was confirmation bias. Unsurprisingly, we like to hear that we're right, which leads to echo chamber and rabbit hole effects on social media, which very rapidly can lead to amplified polarization. Secondly, we looked at negativity bias. 
which posits that we pay more attention to threats on our life than any other kind of information, which means that fake news creators, because they're not shackled by the weights of truth, they're free to make whatever kind of ludicrous sensationalist claims about threats they want. And finally, we have a heightened sensitivity to social information. When we're uncertain about issues, we tend to just follow the crowd, and social media has allowed us to do this perhaps easier than ever. This kind of blind following of the crowd leads to less executive control over our decisions and our opinions, and overall in our society will lead to less variety of opinion and more polarization. And so I'll leave you with this quote from Mark Twain. If you don't read the newspaper, you're uninformed. If you do read the newspaper, you're misinformed. Thank you for watching. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Usually at this point in the video, this is where I would ask you to subscribe and ring that notification bell down below, but it feels kind of wrong given the topic of the video. So I guess you can still do that if you want to, but otherwise, here's a challenge. The challenge is to, right now, turn off all notifications on your phone. Not just the ones from Facebook or from social media, but turn off literally all notifications on your phone and let me know how long you last. The forfeit for turning them back on again is you have to come back to this video and leave a comment below letting me know how long you lasted. One final thing before you go, if you're interested in this topic, I'll have a link to a paper that I got most of the information for this video from below. It's written by one of my professors at the University of Warwick, Thomas Hills, and it's called The Dark Side of Information Proliferation. So if you want a really in-depth look at the topics I discussed in this video, go check that out. It's really well written and you'll definitely learn something new. All right, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.